Oh, uh, too easy. So today this is my first ever podcast. So guys, please bear with me if it's not that great, but we'll see how this turns out. Um, so today I've got my first guest here ever. I'm breaking my virginity, as, as is he, with one of his interviews. Taking it again. Yeah, <laughs> second time around. Um, a good friend of mine, believe it or not, Kieran Dole uh, from Lucky Entertainment, Ultra Music Festival, Esoteric. Um, There's the, a few more things. The list goes on, but I'm sure we can get through that afterwards. What I'll actually, I'll ask you, like, what else What else are you doing that I'm missing apart from some of the big ones? Uh, at the moment, me personally or just as a... Well, I guess the collaborative... As a group, we're pretty lucky uh, at the moment. That oh, bullshit. Yeah, okay. Good call. <laughs> <laughs> you got me already. <laughs> Full of gags. Uh, we're pretty fortunate uh, at, at the moment to have quite a few people uh, involved in our organization that work across uh, everything. I've, I've got, you know, six or seven partners that are constantly out and about creating opportunities and uh, are good at different things in their, in their different roles. So we've got a Billboard Nightclub. Um, we've currently working on another two venues which probably can't say right currently now because it's, it's not ready yet um we've got uh esoteric festival which is a bush stuff which is one of my favorites um uh ultra music festival which is the big edm thing um we've got good things as well oh, uh, yeah. which the newbie which carlo's into uh, which is like a live a live music show and then we've got another festival as well which I probably can't mention just yet but that's in in the works okay i don't think i even know about this one yeah uh i'll yeah we'll speak about that hopefully later maybe <laughs> and then we've got uh, our agency which is our uh sort of core business model for fair and tie business and that's got uh we represent acts from australia all around the world um we've got multiple little other facets as well like uh lucky connect uh, which is like an influencer marketing um, corporate, which is basically just focused on corporate shows for our talent. Um, we've got a design arm, which we're trying to go up against you at, at, oh. at, at Mad Creative. Yep. Um, Unsuccessfully at the moment. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> standard. Um, and then what else? I mean, that's sort of it, you know. Uh, we we sort of pride ourselves on... Obviously the, club nights and stuff, which I'm assuming you call lucky events. Yeah, sorry. Somehow you kind of forget them because, you know, as you know, Danny, you, you, you do so many of them. Hey. So, you know, you probably forget about what, what they're all called. But we've, we've got multiple club nights that we work across Victoria and, and Australia and they all work relatively well. Some Sometimes they don't, sometimes yep. they do. So the nature um, of the game. But that's sort of our, our business in a nutshell with... Funnily enough, today I, I just spoke to a, a coffee cart guy to come and take a, uh, put his coffee cart at, at the front of Billboard so we can start selling coffee. And yeah, then nice. we're potentially doing um, a party bus company thing to ferry people back and forth from our events. So yep. stuff like that we're always looking, looking yeah, yeah. to do. Yeah, you know? whatnot. You kind of get a bit older and you sort of don't want to be in nightclubs as much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's one of those things. It's like a bit of a, it's a bit of a, we started it thinking it's one thing like working in club scene, but as yeah. you know, the networks you make and, the people you come across and the connections that come with it, mm -hmm. it's what you make it. Like it's, 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 it's the kind of foundations of whatever business you want to create after that. Yeah. I think if, um, you know, you and I've been doing this for a long time. I think if someone asked you 10 to 12 years ago, what you'd be doing right now, I don't think it'd be, um, sitting in a room chatting to you about all our successes and all our yeah, no, losses, no you know, I think when, when you turn 17, so even 16 really, and you start getting into, Music and arts and, and entertainment, and you just really just in it for the love of yeah, passion, FTL. love of the beats, bro. You know, yeah, that's it. And then and then you just progress, and all of a sudden it's twelve years later, and, and you're thirty years old. Yeah. So so take take us back to like when you're eighteen, sure. you sort of just finished school. Um, you're obviously starting just to go out. Mm. What's the scene look like? What are you doing? What do you think you're gonna do when you grow up? Like, where do yeah. you sort of? It was a funny one for me when I was eighteen because um, I I did year twelve. I had a really good group of friends. And we all finished year 12. Um, I did pretty well in my score. I uh, enrolled in uni and then got six months in and just wasn't in interested and really should have taken a gap year in, in reality, but didn't. And then really just found a passion for the music scene at the moment. I was super interested in how it worked, about what clubs were operating where, but who was doing what. I knew all the all the sort of players at, at the time. I knew what they were doing and knew, you know, and at that sort of, at that sort of age, all my friends are like, what are you worried about that for, you know? But yeah, it yeah. just sort of stuck in me. And, and, and then, then when I st started DJing myself with my friend Adam. Oh, um, Kazam. Yeah. Shout out to Moddy. Yeah, shout out to Moddy. <laughs> he's, he, I don't know, he's, who knows what that guy's doing. <laughs> nah, I've got his wedding in two weeks. So. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then, you know, we just, there was a, a massive underground drive for 
the genre of music. I wouldn't like. What, what would you call it? Like, I don't know. Back then, what do we call it? When it first started, um, Melbourne Sound, I guess. Like, yeah, it, it was, was this. It was electro originally. Like, that's the foundations of it. It was. It was. And like then a, it was like. It would, they people named it after the club, so it was like TV music, Corovi music. It didn't really have a genre yet, but it was still sort of a dirty word. In, yeah, for sure, one hundred percent. It in was amongst. Um, I wouldn't even call it mainstream. I just call it amongst everyone. Really, yeah. you know, you had your core group of fans, and so, you know, people like myself, Mickey Knox, um, Heath Renata, Stevie Mink, you know, even like Coleman and, and those guys. Who yeah, were, for sure. T Rex orchestrated. Blah, I mean, blah, blah. they were the OGs, and we were just all the young kids sort of starting out. And well, then, I guess it's like even for me, obviously, I was heavily influenced and in, by the same thing, but. Mm. Was watching those guys like Nick Coleman, T Rex, Boogs, mm. um, orchestrated, and it's like we um, sort of started trying to recreate that. Yeah, I think we took it one step further from them, and then yeah. as guys came along, they took it another step further, and yeah. it kind of broke off. But yeah, I agree. It was definitely a dirty word. Like working as a promoter that sort of um, specialised in that in a sense, yeah. yeah, and try to spending so much time trying to grow it. Yeah, I was definitely wasn't wasn't anyone's <laughs> favourite. Put it that way. So well, it's funny. It's quite ironic now that. You know, I, I own Billboard, so very nice yeah, club yeah. where Luke, uh, my current partner, um, said that we were never allowed to play ever. Yeah, I know, no, yeah, that was it. And that was the thing I remember, <laughs> like, like, at the out, time, you know, working with Luke, and obviously we were doing Corova at the time, back back in the day, Corova Fridays, yes. um, which was the origin for a lot of us, like a lot of people who are still yeah. working in the industry now. Yeah. Um, we, like, I would say some guys like uh, myself, you, yeah. uh, Kyle Hand, um, Daniel Lamana from That Sound. Mm-hmm. Um, l- the list goes on from who kind of began and started from that and yeah. what they've done with it. Mickey Knox, like John Doe, like Heath Renata. Yeah. W- uh, go- it goes forever. There's no doubt. Um, when we first sort of started with that, tra- and talking to guys like the commercial guys, who were just like, nah, this is never ever mm-hmm. going to work in a commercial space. Like, and they were always like super salty as well, you know? They're again, yeah. well, they were, I don't know, like they hated us. Like that was basically, <laughs> yeah. the, to be fair, that was what it was. And then I remember that we sort of got a couple of opportunities, yeah. small ones. And, and I remember trying to beg Luke, your yeah. current business partner, like, come on, man, just give him one go, one yeah. go. He's like, nah, never, never in this venue. And then now it's, pro- it's basically what started and created the, his primary business. Yeah, <laughs> it's like, what a twist. <laughs> but he'll say he never said that. Yeah, okay, fair enough. Yeah, I, I definitely remember hearing it. <laughs> but yeah, I guess those early days were, were fun and awesome and, I'd love to hear more about it. Like what, what was, when you first sort of started DJing, like what did you love about it? I think like, um, I, I, I vividly remember the way we all got our music, uh, all consumed our music back then. It was all from um, forums. Yeah, I remember that, yeah. Um, what was it called? Melbourne? No, there was so many. There was like, he was 15 and he had to keep it super secret because all of a sudden yeah, someone yeah. would get on one and then it'd get too many hits and they'd close it down and move yeah. to a new one. It was like a guerrilla underground yeah, yeah. music sharing thing. and. We also paid, um, I remember vividly, we paid this kid $50 per CD. Every CD, he'd give us 11 songs on it. Wow. But that'd be like, that. those 11 songs would be just absolute bangers. Rubbish. Oh, out, bangers are rubbish. Out of control. Like, so what, he'd just scroll through Beatport and look for no, shit? No, he then... was on, um, I can't remember the name of the forum. It was some electro junkies or yeah, something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know yeah, what yeah, I mean? Yeah. One of these this is like, when it was like still kind of based in America yeah, before it kind of Like you needed a video. password to get yeah, in yeah. and you had to be cousins of someone to yeah. get anyway. And this, yeah. is my, this is MySpace days for those people playing, oh, yeah, yeah, playing yeah, out yeah, there. Yeah. This is well before Facebook and I yeah. guess that's probably why we were yeah. looking for stuff like that. I mean, MySpace only really just started. So you are only really using MySpace as a way of like, this is my top friends and what are you commenting on yeah. things and that was it so it wasn't really a way of sharing anything yeah no not at all I um, mean you could have music on your profile yeah that but was that was cool. the, that was the way we, that we sort of you know got our music and it was still really underground and you felt like a what? a real sort of um, like a real trophy when you got a, like a record that yeah, no one I remember, had yeah I remember vividly um, John Doe which who back then I think was called Him and Him Viva the Fever Viva the Fever whatever it is yeah and then um, Heath Renata and no, that was Daniel Steinberg um, that what would I like to be or yeah truck was. train airplane. yeah and um, he and I remember him Heath playing it <laughs> at, no other way around it was so I remember Vadim playing it Heath hearing him play it and like they literally almost went to blows at the front. Like they so were about to punch I'll on. I'll tell you a funny story about those two. Wow. Is that one day we went I'm to, sure there's plenty of funny stories. We went to through. Vadim's house, right? And Vadim lived in, in Q on Barker's yeah. Road. I could point you the exact house. And um, he went. He, we went there. It was one of the first times we ever went there and like hung out with like met his parents. He went to have a shower and then Fiend Heath jumped on his computer. Stole, his stole all of his tunes. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't know. I, just, I just remember like when I first, obviously because I was, I was actually running Corova at the time so I was the main promoter of it. Yeah. <clears throat> and I kind of, I guess I found a lot of you boys and yeah, a lot yeah. of the guys in the early days. Mm. Um, I sort of, I guess, 
groomed into their oh, careers course. to now. Of course. But um, just how passionate everyone was. And they were just so passionate about music. Like the fact that they were trying to punch on over, over, a, song. over a song just sort of showed you, I think, in a sense, where all that success came from. Yeah. So I remember you were playing a, uh, a song that you had at the time. It was probably maybe towards middle of Corova, but the first time I sort of paid attention to yourself Stranger. and Stranger. Nah, it wasn't that. <laughs> uh, as, so yeah. it was... Um, I remember being like, oh, cool watching the other boys. And obviously you guys predominantly didn't make as much music or weren't, weren't we didn't really make known any. as producers. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So we're, the other boys were... getting would, high all the time. Yeah. And then um, <laughs> I remember Defresh that... Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And you playing and I was like, fuck, what a bomb. Showtime. Yeah, Showtime Defresh. I remember thinking, what a fucking bomb. And then that became... I then started to go out of my way to watch your sets yeah. to hear that tune. And that was a yeah. thing back then. Like yeah. people would cover the, um, the CDJ yeah. to make sure no one could see the song Mate, and, and you, 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 you kind of owned it. And like, yeah. if you had the hot song at the time, people would follow you around and come yeah. try it's, to watch it's it. seriously what, what it was. And I reckon that was, to be honest, is the creation of that whole sound. Like I generally believe because of that competition, because mm. of that access to forums that blew up, mm. it made guys like who were very aggressive about it, like guys like Heath and mm. and um, and Mickey Knox, Metro, whatever. Like they had to mm. make they had to make tunes. Yeah. So that's why I think it kind of pushed them into that realm. I think it was something that naturally progressed because yeah. of access to music. So prior to that, you could get a tune, you could keep a tune for a while, and that could kind of help your career. Mm. Whereas with this, it was like, well, okay, well, fuck it, I don't want anyone to have it. So how the fuck am I going to avoid that? Yep. I'm going to have to make something. And yep. then they, all the guys who were really passionate about it, it was like, that was it. Like, you know, like if you weren't, didn't have the hottest song, you couldn't make tunes. It was like, good luck fucking yeah. getting a gig. Yeah, You're like, stuffed. Oh, unless you could sell tickets. Yeah, <laughs> and, and you're in. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, then you're headlining. Yeah. <laughs> I'll give you a gig weekly. Spin doctors. <laughs> <laughs> Man, I, I had poor, right? But yeah, they, um, Orange whip. Yeah, that was the way it was. And I think that um, if it wasn't for those things, like the forums coming up and... Um, MySpace and people sort of becoming so common with the music and being able to have mm. access to it, like Bport and stuff. I don't know that we would have had that, um, I guess, transgression of mm. Electro House that turned into its own style. And I don't believe that it was done on purpose. I think it just accidentally happened. And there must have been an original <coughs> tune, which, in my opinion, was Faces the Method sort of started yeah, a little oh, bit. Yeah, that was an absolute weapon. Uh, all Beach Ball orchestrated. And yeah. then it was sort of like from there, they were like probably underproduced attempts at yeah. some electro tune yes and then that kind of turned into another byproduct and genre that yep. has made myself and yourself a lot of money mm. over the last 10 years so um and taking us probably to places that we never ever expected we'd, we'd go yeah of course like new zealand yeah let's, let's, <laughs> let's not go into that <laughs> when was that it was like 2010 or something i don't know so yeah just a quick, I I, i'm not gonna go into detail Auckland. about it because yeah it was it was a messy and sloppy weekend but back in the early days um I spent a lot of time on investing in this Melbourne sound. When I say investing, not money, because I had none, but um, in just like basically spamming all day, every day, mm -hmm. people on Facebook from all around the world. And we were lucky enough to sort of work out like a DJ swap overseas mm. with a club in New Zealand. And um, kids and myself went over there and it was sort of the first ever international gig for probably anyone that made that style of music yeah. or played that style yeah. of music. But um, I mean, we hadn't even really been to Sydney before. Yeah, we hadn't. <laughs> even, we literally went to New Zealand before we did it, we, before we did Ballarat. <laughs> but, um, even Geelong. Yeah, so it was a good opportunity. It was good and they rece it was received well, but it never actually blew up in New Zealand, that music. But um, it was messy. It was a good time. But this sort of goes, shows back our history that we're talking 2019 now and that was 2010. That was good fun. I, I actually still speak to that guy. Dilds. Um, yeah, Dilds. Yeah, yeah, shout out to Dilds. Yeah. He's <laughs> yeah. definitely not listening, but... Yeah. <laughs> he might be. Yeah. Um, but he's yeah, a, so... He's a, I've got him on Facebook guy. too, but yeah. yeah, that was good times. I think one of them, uh, Overkill, I think his name is now, he had some success in, in America, I believe. Did he really? Yeah, oh, the, I'm not, I'm not too sure. the, the not too sort sure. of Lankin bloke. Yeah, I just see Dilds who... Bought a house in yeah, the yeah, he's Auckland. Living, he's on him. living the family life. Well done. Um, yeah, and I, I guess what was when? What did you feel apart from obviously technology and whatnot? Like what? What did you feel like was different back then than sort of now? I was, I was just thinking before. I tell you what. I, I remember uh, every club you went to, the DJs would always play two hours, possibly yeah, three sure. hours. Yeah. That'd be it, and a lot of them were playing actual wax records as well. Yeah, early, early days. And then yeah. we. Early you know, for us days, and we came in, and I I didn't learn on 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 wax at all. I learned on like a CD CJ one hundred, which you needed the CD to put in. Yeah, the um, actual jog wheel didn't work at yeah, all. Yeah. You were just really just taking the piss. But it, it it took a lot of skill to use something that didn't work, and then yeah. to beat Using match everything yeah, yeah, sure. and put it in key and all the rest of it, and still try and mix properly. So I remember the sort of transition from like these guys who I was watching them, they were so super skilled and they were actually playing proper records and, 
and playing the full extended. Have you ever attempted it properly? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. fucking hard. Yeah, I know. It, it is really hard. I can get it in for like maybe 20 seconds. Yeah. And then by the time I start touching knobs, just yeah. see you later. I mean, the thing about Wax like versus like a, a CDJ is you're able to pause and stop a CDJ whenever yeah, you minute your stuff up with, with, with records. Yeah. You can't. Good luck. Yeah, you're, you're in trouble. So, I mean, I was never really, really good at it at all, yeah. but had a, had a few cracks at it. Anyway. Um, I remember going from that sort of that sort of two hour, three hour set period to us young kids literally coming in, banging out thirty records in a, in an hour, yeah, yeah, and yeah, and playing whatever we wanted, pausing it, queuing it, yeah, yelling, and all then, the effects and whatnot, and it was yeah. a, it became a new game. So, funnily enough, I remember like uh, back when Tiffy was at Waratah Place, which is now Wawa. Yeah. So going back way a long time ago, yeah. I remember <clears throat> there was a DJ called PK at the time. He made a tune, Peter Clathis from Willis Hill. And he, the tune was sort of bigger before it was, a, it was actually a bootleg. It wasn't even a tune, but the, the bootleg blew up and it was so big that I guess he had to sort of start to perform it because people yeah, wanted sure. to watch it. Yeah. yeah. No, nah, it wasn't that. It was, um, oh. that'd be good to me. Oh yeah. Belter. But it was like a prodigy remix with, yeah, yeah. anyway, but it was wicked. Why don't you try to <laughs> I remember friends. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me. Um, uh, anyway, so he, I remember he was, he only played on. Uh, CDJs and yes. I remember going to like St. Sundays which was called Fuck Mondays back yeah, then yeah, yeah. by a guy called Nick Corvo which was the place to be mm-hmm. I remember everyone bagging him out like all the guys being mm. like that dude only fucking plays on CDJs mm. like what the fuck yeah it's true and now it's like people don't even beat match anymore like that it's it's gone no. from it's gone from it's gone full circle and now I've, I've heard guys be like they don't even play fucking they don't even know how to use the jog wheel it's like yeah mate it's just no matter what I guess as as, as technology continues it's like there's always going to be old DJs bagging yeah. out new DJs. I think. Yeah, it's just the same with, with anything in life, isn't it? You know? I think one of the biggest things that I notice is that the, the which I still find strange because it never makes sense to me, mm. and we'll kind of go into this, I guess, from the management perspective from you, mm-hmm. is just the, the amount that people don't separate themselves. It's like from. everybody emulates just each other. Yeah. So you always get, because everyone has access to the same tunes, obviously they get them from, I have no fucking idea where they get them from now. Mm. Where, where do they get them from, Kyle? SoundCloud or what? Yeah, it's just all SoundCloud. Yeah. Um, Pass them around, yeah. Facebook Messenger, yeah. who knows? Beatport's yeah. obviously huge. Beatport, but there's like, yeah. but they just, you like, you listen to a young promoter DJ, then you listen to someone like, say, Dwayne or Short, Short Round. Obviously, they have access to mm. better tunes and like, like mm. exclusives, so like stuff that comes out quicker. Yeah. But um, it's pretty much the fucking same. Look, this there's is not, there's this not is a whole a, lot of difference. This and is I think a really that, tough. How do you set, like, I guess from your end, it's like, how do you feel? I, we'll go into two parts of the question. So yeah. the first part would be like, what's the difference? But well, how have you seen people set themselves apart so massively that they can make it um, a transition or a difference? <clears throat> and uh, do you believe what I'm saying with the emulation thing is is probably the reason why people aren't succeeding as well as they could be? Yeah. So this is a, a, a super tough argument. It's something that we get quite consistently. It's like, if if I'm an up and comer. And I deviate too far from the norm, which yep. I'm talking about norm. You know, there's a general realm of what yeah, everyone sure, plays yeah. or whatever in Melbourne. If I deviate too far from the norm, I, I, will I still get booked? Will, will people recognise my creative yeah. differences? Am I even good enough to be creative and, yeah, and be different? That. And then, um, you know, do I want to continue? Do I want to live off this? Or do I want to do it as, as a hobby? Yeah. And Jay, one of my partners, always gives really good advice. He goes... The so Jay, that's Jay Butt. So yeah, of, sorry. Yeah, it's just saying full names because people don't know who they are. But yeah, Jay Butt Hole. Um, <laughs> he um, he he's always he's, he's always said that you know DJing shouldn't be your main source of income. Yeah, for sure. The I- issue is with all these kids. They're eighteen, nineteen. They haven't got a job, or they do have a job. So when you say that, I'll define that. So you're saying when you first start out, don't quit and try to put all your pennies into the one basket. Because no. obviously someone like Will, he's not going to go get Will Sparks. He's not going to go get listen. A Will, job. Will was still working, like yeah. when he was like but now I'm eighteen, eighteen nineteen. He, now. he he was still laboring. Yeah, he was still all the rest of it while he was playing ten shows on on the weekend yeah, sure, and yep. not getting any sleep. I think if you treat that's beyond me how people do that. Oh, insane! But you know we're not eighteen anymore. Yeah. Like we probably did it when we were eighteen. Mate, I was waking up at eleven thirty in the fucking morning, yawning. <laughs> <laughs> now, no, then still now, nothing's changed. You do this for thirteen years, you get good at being lazy. <laughs> I think you've always been good at lazy. <laughs> what do you mean? <laughs> Sleep um, is a virtue. <laughs> uh, what was I saying? So yeah, I, 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 we really, we're a big pusher in the fact that you shouldn't treat. Um, DJing or whatever at this level as your main source of income yeah, you keep you're only going to disappoint yourself mm-hmm. you're going to be playing shows and, and, and lowering your sights in order to 
create income in order to survive. Yeah. Which is wrong because you want to be able to do this as a hobby and, and, and flaunt right your creative differences and, yeah, for sure. and be able to show people who I guess like guys I've seen that have done that, guys like Zach Waters for argument's sake, who yeah. was super popular. Yeah, yeah. And then he sort of deviated to something different, which yeah. was maybe too ahead of its time in my opinion. Yeah. And then it sort of affected his um, club gigs, which Zach, is obviously where your majority of your Zach's income comes a, from. Zach's a, a very, very, very talented person. Yeah. And um, to be honest, I actually, and I'm, I've never told you this, but I, I, I attribute him changing his music to you carrying yeah. on about the Maltrance thing all the time. Did he? It was oh, I don't even really remember that. I've carried on about so much. You've carried on about, about, about so much stuff, like <laughs> like things like this. You know, like you, you're a voice that that sort of people people these kids look at. You know, and when yep. when you're getting hammered constantly for the genre of music you are, of course for me it's I guess just a bit of fun. But yeah, no, it's hard, know, it's hard to sort of step back sometimes. And but I suppose going back to the question, I I, I definitely think that the financial um, factors are a big one. Yeah. If these kids have DJing as a hobby, then they'll be able to. Um, spread their wings a little and 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 be able to change. I yeah. think the kids who are constantly doing the same thing as everyone else, it's no it's no fault of their own. They're just watching people like Dwayne and Shorty and Ork. They're yeah. watching them all succeed off playing the same music that they, that they want to play. Yeah. So why would they not do do the same thing? Yeah. And that can only last for so long because promoters will only use them for so long until, to be honest, the sad part of it, they stop bringing people. Yeah, hundred you know? percent. And, and from my, they, from, even from mine as a promoter, it's like I want hundred percent agree. Yeah. Like, yeah only help people out not not won't help people out if they're good they're talented whatever like yeah. until, as long as they're going to show interest in what i'm doing yeah i'll continue to show interest in them as soon as they decide that they're not going to uh, yeah i'm not going to keep carrying them of, of, what, of it's course. one of those things from a promoter's perspective yeah. rather than a management one it's like watching people guys like you will yeah. um G- joel heath renata like guys mm. that have done bigger even massive acts like sunset bros whatever mm. what you can you can tell like in the early stages like watching these acts i mm. just remember paying 250 dollars to do uh to will sparks mm. on a tuesday night at uh orange whip mm. and there was like 750 people in there and the dude was fucking 20 putting on a show that looked like like yeah. he should have been on the main stage which obviously is now yeah and i just remember thinking to myself what the fuck like mm. this is the, i've not seen anything like this before yeah. and there was and there's been maybe four or five times in my life that I've seen that. One of them was Flume. Yep. So Flume played at um, Purple Sneakers. Yep. And at the time, I was booking uh, What's Our Night at Fake Tits, which yep. was a successful Melbourne night at Tramp that ran for five years. Yeah, good plug. And, um, yeah, good plug. The reunion. No. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> successful. So we were booking like What's Our Night, Peking Dark. Like we were booking yeah, a lot of these. Yeah, Danny yeah. T, those guys yeah, were sweated yeah. out at the time. Yeah. And uh, Flume was, I don't know, he would have been eight and a half or something. And I... The Chris Emerson, who's what's so night, he was like, "Hey, uh, like put me in contact with him," mm. and I was like, "Hey, dude, um, can I come down and watch his show?" So mm. he chucked me on freeze, and I went down to watch him at Purple Sneakers. Yep. And I was just like, "What the fuck?" Yeah, like, yeah. I, I've seen a lot of music, a lot of sets. Yeah. I've seen a lot of this shit, and I was just like, as soon as I saw it, I was like, "This dude is gonna be big." Never thought he was gonna get as big as what he yeah, did. Yeah. It's amazing at what level he's at now. Now he's eating ass on yeah, stage yeah. in Coachella. <laughs> a burning, a burning man. <laughs> Sorry, I could. Yeah, but I was just man. like, I just remember seeing it. It's like it, they're very few and far between when you see those acts, and yeah. just like. Fuck me, like I mean, these guys on the, the other thing is, is do you like, think that's something that you can emulate or try, or do you think it just no, comes like, naturally? And people like Flume and Will, and even like the, the Duck Boys, they've literally the Duck Guys like changed electronic pop really, like, yeah, like to an extent, you yeah, know. Yeah, it started. They were the DJs who picked up instruments. Well, they used to play like a hard electro bass, like campus yeah, Like stuff. they've had heaps like so many records that have gone platinum and, and, and all the rest of it you know they literally change that thing and I, I've heard in, in so many conversations around the world you know like oh we're making music like 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 the Duck Boys or like like well, even, High or like this you know and then Flume Flume isn't another talent in, in itself like yeah. he literally, he literally created, created his own genre, genre yeah. you know like and now hip hop people talk about as Flume and, music you know yeah yeah but like and, when you look at the majority of pop albums these days and there's Flume elements correct to it. you know so I don't think it's it's hard I think if you look at uh, but at, again at like going through to the Duck thing you're saying like again I remember booking them years and years ago and yeah. I remember just thinking when I met them not even when they played yeah just thinking these dudes are fucking rock stars like they yeah. look like rock stars they are they, rock stars they followed their own their, they, they did their own thing it's just the way they looked the way they acted yeah. they're like they just toppled two boys from Canberra but they yeah. were just like did I know they were destined for big things yeah well, not I mean, necessarily but they look like MTV fucking hosts yeah. like that's the way they <laughs> yeah. were so they, they cool. and then sure enough like look where they are now yeah. the presence they held in, 
even off stage was just amazing. Yeah, I mean Ben Dennis is a like smart guy. He's, For sure, he's he's very calculated and um, he's done some great things, and so is John Hanlon. Yeah. Um, but you look at Adam, he's just like yeah, he, he looks it looks like yeah, he had like the fur coming out, yeah, and the skin shirt, and I was on. just like, no one was doing that. Like that was, yeah. I was like, what the fuck? Yeah. It's hard to pull that sort of stuff off. Like he looked like <laughs> look, one of these dudes from LA from the f- movies in the A, like John Holmes or some shit. Yeah, kind of looks like you a little bit <laughs> now, maybe, but not as not as big a dick. Um, yeah, but he, he looked like a, no, exactly. No, he looked like um, he looked like a porno star. Oh. <laughs> so it kind of didn't surprise me when he moved into it. But yeah, uh, the question going back to what we're saying is that. So it's like, do you think it's something like right time, right place, like the right personality? This the, or the, can it be emulated, or is it like Man, you got it or you don't? If you look at um, if you look at the time frame of all the artists who have done well in our era. Mm-hmm. To I could be openly honest with you, it was the right time. Yeah, I agree. Right time, right, right place. But if you look currently in the current world, you have to be super talented in order yep. to hit that level of fame, like like Will and and Flume, and I mean not comparing you know them two, but I'm yeah, saying for sure. to get out of this Australian e- ecosystem, you yep. need to be you need to have like an amazing amount of talent. Um, but there's a lot of acts out there who have that amazing drive and have a really good team behind them, um, who are able to sort of push forward even though they may not have uh, a, je- a genre bending um, production skill in would them. you say someone like uh, Timmy Trumpet who obviously had commercial success in Australia for listen many, Timmy many Trumpet years. is the hardest working person in Australian yeah, music but, but he sort of started he would have done what six years on the circuit in Australia obviously six, did well tri- successful 15 yeah and then he's now blown up to be an international superstar huge, across the world huge and you know everyone's so happy for him everyone's super proud of him he's done an amazing job he's got a huge team but he's still grinding every every single day, yeah. and you know we we always tell him. I remember his tour schedule. Well just done, like, mate. You've absolutely nailed it. And he, he would do thirty two days in a row. It's like how the fuck do you do that? Mental, mental. Yeah. He's 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 on that Steve Aoki tip. It's yeah. just a guy who is just <clears throat> constantly onto it all, all the time, always innovating, always trying new things, always doing something. Like he'd probably wake up. Timmy'd probably wake up with his glasses and his hat on. Yeah, and, yeah. And like I have a shower with his hat on. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> he's yeah. always in character. Yeah, no shit. I, I agree with that. Um. I guess, yeah, okay, so kind of diverting off the music stuff because I don't want to get stuck on it. Um, obviously, now you guys are working in events or you sort of moved in from music to events and adapted your business into something more than just an agency, which I think a lot of agencies in the, in their past failed to do and that's why they're sort of not around mm-hmm. now. Yep. Um, when you did move from from music management, uh, music booking agent, whatnot, into events, like what were sort of some of the difficulties you had uh, the biggest difficulty we had was not wanting to burn um, relationships. Correct, yeah. and not wanting to shit where we eat. Yeah, for we're sure. We're selling acts to people like yourself. Yeah. How are we able to then promote a night ten k's down the road? In I in, think the in, early in days, like you talk, it. obviously probably comes to surprise a lot of sorry to surprise a lot of people that myself and Kieran are talking so nicely to each other one <laughs> now because at one point we were very very hostile even though we mm. stayed good friends behind the scenes but i hated online, online denny grant yeah <laughs> business wise we were very both it was aggressive there's no denying that and um kieran actually deleted me on facebook and and, and blocked you <clears throat> just recently has he re-added me <laughs> after a four year four year hiatus and me promising that i i, I amended my um you have changed though yeah i'm a better to man. be fair i don't know it's maybe getting old or maybe it's like piper's done it to you yeah <laughs> <laughs> but um so yeah, I guess that was probably maybe one of the reasons when we when that all kind of kicked off and there was yeah. a lot of aggression towards you guys yeah. was because there was those issues because I was actually talking about something today about mm. how we had booked an act from you guys yep. and they randomly rocked up at Lucky Thursdays and then that was a fight and it was like... Um, Who was that? It was before Sounds Like Summer. I don't want to say the act. Okay, don't worry about it then. Yeah, so anyway, <laughs> but yeah, and then there was aggression there and yeah, there was yeah. whatever. But I feel like... We now all, yeah. you've done a, you've seen to have done a better job to now you don't like, I don't feel like anything you guys are doing is direct competition to anybody per se no we um, were always like super um, weary of, of of starting things that impacted our current relationships or current business yep. models in reality but um, we've kind of found our niche now I don't we don't we don't do a lot in other people's spaces yeah we sort of tend to go well this is what we know let's 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 stick to that. If if we are looking to do something in someone else's space, it's very a small, a yeah. very small thing, you know. Um, but and we've got a massive team, and you know everyone needs to eat. And, yeah, for sure. Yeah. And we're constantly, constantly growing. So if an opportunity sort of came our way to do to do something um, in any any world, I'd definitely look at it, and mm-hmm. I'd be like, well, uh, should we do this or not? But the thing is about the current Melbourne scene is everyone's 
so it's I feel like it's all been shaken up and everyone the dust is settling. Mm. Everyone's found their corner. I feel like I think obviously in my opinion there was a bit of a when all the events started off, like guys like Untitled and whatnot kicked off and there's an event every second weekend. Yes. I feel like a lot of the promoters was maybe hanging on by a thread fell off. Yes. So now we're kind of left with the 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 OGs and, well, the, and the guys who really know the industry. It's and, all kind of settled and now. It's almost like there's enough people for the amount of promoters there is. Yeah, and there's um, enough respect, I think, amongst everyone to, knows each other, to, to coexist. Yeah, you know, and I like think we, we work with you, yeah. we work with the Untitled guys, we work with guys and Tramp, we work with everyone. Yeah. Geelong, I just, Ballarat, it, I've, never been, I've never been involved in the industry ever at this point where mm. everyone's so nice to each other. Yeah. So it's like I'll, I, at the moment, work at... Berkshire Street Courtyard, but uh, used to be called Royal Melbourne Hotel. And last mm-hmm. week there was like Boris, Morsh. Yeah. Um, it's good. Yeah, there was like, we it's were down there, myself, Nick, Keno, Luke. Like, there was probably at any given point, there was uh, Lev, the dudes from Day Spas. Like, there was probably 10 different promoters there that day, and it was sort of hugging and kissing. And I've never seen that. Yeah. <laughs> so it's like, no, it's, 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 it's interesting good. to see. I agree with you. I, think I, I believe that there'll be new kids coming up, which is good. I think it's healthy for competition. Well, you just let me know their names. Yeah. <laughs> I know a couple. <laughs> yeah, just like, Add me on over. Facebook. I'll do you like, every favor in the world. Have you ever worked in my venue? <laughs> Don't say your name to these people. Yeah, so I guess you saw it as a challenge. And yeah, it was a massive when you challenge. First started. Me, me personally, I was, um, Luke and I, I was the agent. I was the lead agent. I repped every single one of our acts. We had about 25 to 28 acts and I was literally repping every single one of them. We turned over an insane amount of money, Luke and I, just by ourselves in, in 12 months. It was mm. huge. I never... Anyway, it was, it was, it was a big dollars. That's when we said, look, we need to, we need to get help here because yeah. you know, my wife's, my fiance at the time was about to leave me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of <laughs> I need to get some sleep and stop traveling the world and actually, you know, do that. So... We um we sort of settled and we we started staffing up and then that's when I said well that's that's my time to tap out of being an agent yep. an agent you know I I represent Ty Gooley I still do to this day because she's the one I sort of found and um and we work super well together and she's she's a breeze she knows what she wants mm. she, she knows how I work and that works really well for us yeah um around Australia and New, and New Zealand um so I've held on to that but other than that myself I I don't do any agency stuff at all oh, okay. I, I still I consult. Wasn't aware of that, yeah. Yeah, I still, I mean, it's not a really well-known fact. I don't really tell a lot of people, but I still um, help, obviously, everyone out. We, yep. we, we've got a really good team now. Um, yep. Reese Painting's an amazing agent. Luke Spaggs is really good. Um, Michael Pitarino and Jay Bart still does a little bit. Luke still reps Will, Will Sparks, and mm. we've got another agent as well coming. So it's all uh, it's all good, but myself, personally, Who I don't do a lot agent? of agents. Huh? Who is that new agent? I've heard whispers. Have you? Yeah. Sure you have. He might, I've heard he might have a podcast. <laughs> Is Does that true? You? No, not me. <laughs> Again, you I already got back. one today. Okay, so it's not him. You wouldn't know. Would have known. If someone said something today. I was like, oh, interesting. No, no, no. I don't think he's got a podcast. <laughs> or, or she. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Cool. So the other thing is obviously now you guys are doing esoteric. Uh, esoteric. Es- See, uh, is it called esoteric? People uh, can you say p- the people word? called esoteric. People call it esoteric. Okay. I, I don't know. I call it esoteric. But yeah. It's just me. So you're sort of working in that space and obviously the big one uh, is Ultra Music Festival. Yep. It's going to walk us through how you've gone from management, uh, sorry, probably more so booking agency to management to events and now you're working in the festival space and what were some of the challenges there that you've kind of come across and uh, how big was that jump and how scary was and what's the experience of it all, like running a festival and tell us the numbers first, I guess, just so people can understand how, uh, what the magnitude of these, these events are. Uh, cool. I'll get. I'll get to. I'll. I'll. I'll try to start at the start. Yeah. Um. I. I tell you something. Artist management. Um, gets you prepared for almost a, a, everything. Yeah. You know, I. I found Mashton Kutcher. Um. Off a YouTube video. Um. Put them in. Um. Different co- outfits and and essentially m- manage them to a point where they're able to get on stage. Um. And then from that point, we literally spent four years together, where they did halftime show for the Brisbane mm. Broncos. They were on every no uh, every radio show they did tv stuff they did rage nickelodeon um fanta optus all everything you can imagine they were sort of involved in yeah and taking something um like that from that ground level and then dealing with massive conglomerate media companies, i'm guessing it moves pretty quickly too huge you know yeah. what i mean and you all, all of a sudden nbc in america are calling you and you're doing tours around there because a, a, a radio uh, a video is blown up and then 
you're dealing with Europeans and you're talking in euros and different languages mm. and then all of a sudden trying to manage their business affairs down here. You learn a lot by just things that come at you, you know. And so uh, one more question. I don't want to divert too much from yeah. the original question, but it's like one of the things that myself when I used to manage artists, which were low level, which included yeah. yourself because I actually managed Kizam. Did you? To a successful Did we career. pay you? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think so. It Good. was actually for the love job. But yeah, what, so was... I was not that anything moved that fast, but I remember yeah. watching the guys when it did. So everything mm-hmm. was a lot slower back then. Yeah. Um, when when things started to happen rapidly, like we're talking acts being heard for the first time and then playing overseas and three months later. Crazy. Um, that used to scare me. So I'd be like, how can anyone manage this? So how is that? Like when, when you're running it's at tough. that kind of speed and, that, and yeah. that kind of velocity, like as someone that hasn't done it before mm. and is working in the space for the first time like yep. how daunting is that like how it's, it, it, it's super daunting and especially when you see like massive companies at the bottom of your email saying hey Kieran we'd like to do X or Y opportunity with yeah. your, your artist are we able to do it next week you're like I've never even spoken to the newspaper for yeah, starters, yeah. let alone this massive anyway so there's so many and is there got- like a point where you like start to question your own self esteem no, because I've, I've, I mean, this is this is the thing. This is the thing versus an independent manager versus someone in part of a team. Like I had a really good team behind yeah. me, Luke and um, well, Luke at the start, and then Luke Spags and Jay. We all bounce ideas off each other all the time. So if you ever were to do anything wrong, you get absolutely hammered for it. Yeah, okay. But yeah. you've now you've got that that support yeah, behind okay, cool. you. So that's a really handy um, structure. To, it's the, like guys like obviously James Favor with Dom and like. Oh how, yeah, how, for sure. Yeah. How quickly that progressed, and even Luke originally with um. Yeah. I've always just thought, how do they? Yeah, you go from talking to Danny Grant that runs a couple of clubs in the in the mm. um, in the city to mm. guys from WME and guys from yeah, yeah, Ultra crazy. Music, and they're Huge. like, "Hey, what's?" I'm like, "I just feel like there'd be a point Huge. where you're like you start to question yourself, like, how yeah. am, am I the right person for this guy? Like, am I doing the right thing?" And then yeah. how do you overcome you that? You just like, have to trust your absolute basic instinct as a manager because yeah. the way you manage someone is different to the way the next person does. Yeah, you know? of course. And who says you're right? And who says who says they're right? There's yeah. absolutely no rule book in management. Yep. you can listen to all the self-help books you want, or or watch all the or watch all the, the 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 speakers talk about the best ways to manage people. But end of the day, you have to trust your absolute basic instinct, and that's what we've always done. And I think yep. we've done it quite I agree. well. Yeah, I for sure. Like there's to been date, there's been there's been a couple of you know instances and, and bits and pieces where we could have protected scenarios happening. Yeah. Um, that we re- regret not not doing for whatever reason. But now, um, just looking back managing an artist and managing everything about their, like their finances where they live and who yeah. they operate with what music they're writing with who, how this goes there like how long they spend in Darwin compared to how many business class you know everything yeah, yeah, you're yeah. literally managing you wake up every day you think more about this this artist than, than you would do with yourself so I guess back to the question about festivals is like managing an artist has really prepared me I think for everything else moving forward yep. you learn about marketing you learn about time management you learn about logistics you learn yep. about the lingo in um, in relation to labels, Language you learn like to too. you know percentages and neighbouring rights and royalties and all this, all those sort of organisations and bodies. You learn about how they operate and who they are and who they work, which then takes you on to the next step. And the thing about um, events is that it was always a natural, I think, progression for me because I'd always, like I said at the very start, I was yep. always interested in who's who was in the room. Out of all the guys that we worked with, you were definitely the one that was always asking yeah, questions. I don't know why. I don't know why. I was yeah. always interested in, in who owned the place and what they were doing and how yeah. they did it and how many people came through the door and who was the security guard, all that yeah. sort of stuff. So I think yeah, that was I a remember. bit of a natural progression for me. I took over Lucky Thursdays. Um, so it was absolutely failing. Mark Udorovic, Luke Stab owned the bill- billboard. I took over. Yeah, that's an OG. Yeah, he's <laughs> OG. He's the OG, OG. <laughs> yeah, he's, he's just... At home, just stoned all the time, killing it, <laughs> <laughs> loving his life. He's so retired; it's not funny. Spits. Yeah. Anyway, so he's he did, so he's he done goes, some. Goes, goes, no, Kieran. no, I don't think anyone's goes, ever done more goes, time on a door than he has. Yeah, it's unbelievable. There's, there's like the pole he used to lean to on that on a billboard. There's like a like a sort of maybe 300 mil sort of gap. Yeah, but it's, it, worn, it's got like this. silver, then it's got like black from him just like Rolling holding around. on to it <laughs> and it's got silver again it's like Jesus. you know just just from someone's hand just holding rest on rest in it. peace to millions of cigarettes at that spot <laughs> <laughs> it's basically the walking dart yeah <laughs> <laughs> um what was i saying so anyway so i took over lucky thursdays and then that did really well and then i thought stuff it i'm gonna have a crack at a few more things and yep. now we're here we are run, running festivals and it's really only because i put my hand up like an opportunity will come through, like Esoteric sort of came through. Because that was a random one. Because at the time, obviously, yeah. I, I myself ran a brand called Reconnect that was very successful yes. in the event yeah, market. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Small scale, sort of yeah, yeah. twelve to 1,500. Yeah, 
Um, and we kind of came out of nowhere. So there'd been yeah. people doing it for 10 years prior. Obviously, yep. there was the bush doofs, but mm-hmm. from a small scale, we mm-hmm. did reconnect and we were successful and we'd been offered to be involved with some doofs. Oh, yeah. And I was too scared. Yeah. You know, like, that's the reality of it. I was like, oh, no, nah, I don't want to put my money in line. Yep. Like, yep. yeah, I can do these shows. They're pretty low risk. And yep. and then when you guys did Esoteric, like, we, we'd we been doing these shows for two years and you guys were not even on the radar. No. So when and you did it, I thought it was like, I was like, whoa, what? I think um, I, I when Ash Ibrahim, uh, one of my partners, brought uh, Esoteric to the table because he works with Scott um, Smith from H- Hard Candy. Yeah. And Scott was already involved. Anyway, and then... Um, so Ash, Luke Matheson is... Yeah, yeah, Luke. Yeah. Luke is is the most brilliant mind in the that dwarf community. Yeah. The way he thinks, he thinks in colours, and it's insane talking yeah. to that guy. Um, but his his business acumen, um, I wouldn't say is as polished. Yep. Um, he's still an um, doesn't like a, really surprise me in that. Community. No, and yeah, I think yeah. that's he's why we so did, creative. You know, so I think I when we came in, I think that's why we did so well because we went from a guy that had like a ten year background in, in events, mm. just all we did was change the style of music. Yes. To guys that were like legit. For the love, like these yeah. guys are like running uh, parties and bushes for it, and live for it. putting speakers together but and all the and power to them. Like that's yeah, their yeah, life. They sure. absolutely love it. But they need this. This festival um, went went from li- literally selling like 150 tickets in mm. the first year to massive catastrophe. Sell out last to, year. To us, sold out, and yeah. now we're 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 hopefully. I'm not sure when. Do you use a lot of the principles? Out. Would you compare like from uh, a festival level to a club level, like? Do you, obviously, do you use a lot of the principles from the the event level yeah, into yeah, it? And yeah. it, what's the difference? Is there much of a difference you feel, or not really? For, like for the for, so I, okay, I sort of run the, the marketing for for the festival stuff. Yeah. That's sort of my forte. Um, but for the festival stuff, you just have to look bigger. Yeah, of like, course. F- like for the club stuff, like especially if you're out, out, out here in, in Nay Warren, you go okay. I've got a, a pool of people who are going to live in this area. Yeah. They're probably going to be cons- living, doing this. They're probably going to be playing sport. Yeah, it's easy. They're probably going to be eighteen to twenty-four, down, yeah. and that's it. Yeah. Whereas a festival, to this type you, of you've got to look Australia wide. Yeah. You've got to look how are they consuming their media. Is it digital? Is it is it by podcast? Is yeah. it by street stuff? Is it by pamphlet? Is it by not single use plastic items? You know, are, <laughs> there's are, plenty of that. In are they out of vegan? You know, you got to look completely different to the way you'd normally look for like, for a club. So there's 15 different touch points, marketing touch points, where you can reach someone. There's 15 different messages. There's 15 different ways to say yeah. it. Whereas a club, like for like yeah, Thursday, I know exactly who I'm going to yeah, every yeah. single week, you know. So you have to look a little bit a bit wider, and we have a lot of brainstorming meetings. Like we do, like I suppose, um, h- half of our, of our time spent work on these festivals is basically coming up with with ways to reach people. You know, yep. um, are we saying the right things? Are we using the right yeah, colors? That's a big one. Is it the right time to do this? So obviously, know? I wouldn't say they're competitive to you. They're obviously a completely different market. But mm. like obviously, my business partner Cole Hand, mm. uh, he does Babylon, mm-hmm. which is in a similar realm, it's a it's a Bushdorf yep. type festival, but we're not as side trans based or um, I don't know, I don't know enough about Bushdorf to really compare them. Yeah. But I know that the stuff they do, like the the what they post and yep. and things like how they deal with plastic and how yep. they do this stuff, it's just like next level. And I'm just yep. like, how do you like how do you figure this out? Yeah, you know, like yep. seems like a lot of intel goes into. Well, again, because you're talking about team. these, I guess from what I see is mm. a lot of the people that run these festivals aren't mm. necessarily within that community. Yeah. And I had a friend that sold um, lemonade, Clay Thal, shout out to Clay Thal, yeah. C-Pain, um, <laughs> at Babylon. And because he didn't have refined sugar, I think he sold like two, two glasses. Uh, he didn't <laughs> two know. glasses, yeah. Because yeah, yeah. people were like, is this refined sugar? I'm uh, sorry, is this... Non-refined sugar. Yeah. Yeah, and he's yeah. like, yeah, it is. And they're like, oh, I'm, I don't, I'm not going to drink that. Yeah. So he just completely very, missed the mark. And you're talking, at, you're talking at something so minute, like yeah, a yeah. lemonade stand to fail at a, an event that everyone else made money. The you're talking on a bigger scale. Like it must be super hard to understand what they want and like the dwarf community. So specific. The they community, seem to be one of the most pickiest and hardest. It's phenomenal. To do. Yeah. It's it, it's so big. It's bigger than you expected. They come out of the woodwork. They yeah, come yeah. from everywhere. They come from fruit picking in Shepparton. They come yeah. from Byron Bay. They come from just like they're right they're next happy to you at, at work. You know, yeah, these yeah. uh, people that like will will go off on a Friday afternoon, take their suit off, and then put yeah put like robes on, and then go frolic in the bush. You it's know, but they know exactly around. what they want. They know exactly what they well, want. Well, they call them week, weekend hippies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, they know ex- exactly what they want. They know how, how to get it, and they know how to enjoy themselves. But it's a world that no one will understand unless you're sort of in it. But I suppose where we've come and brought value to it was organizing all yep. these things structure yeah and yep. making sure that hang on a minute we can't go out and spend thousands hundreds of thousands of dollars on that because that's not right we need yep. to like do some this art installation or something like that 
Oh yeah, just there's some outrageous ideas. I can imagine. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so they're pretty crazy. I'm like, well, this year, like, uh, I, I know we haven't mentioned it yet. I don't know when you're going to announce uh, release this, but we're putting in a massive giant pool. Yeah. Um, and when I say pool, it's a big massive hole in the water in, in the ground that they're going to dig and put heaps of water, big, big fire hose and stuff. It sounds so, super safe. Well, it is. Like <laughs> we're, we're going to have um, uh, uh, lifeguards. It's yep. going to be patrolled by by Will security. Will the lifeguards also be hippies? Uh, no. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Will they have real life uh, qualifications or just like ones from wizards? <laughs> no, like it's, I think it's part of our permit to have, yeah. have all those sort of enough, things yeah. in it. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, but I mean, that's just, that's just a crazy idea they thought of a year ago. I go, yeah. you, you're nuts. You that's put, cool. Though. Some of like the staging and stuff they do and the, yep. the renegade stages and it's like, yeah. it's hard to compare. Like, that there's not, so a, there's cool. not a lot of that at Esoteric, like this renegade stages. Yeah. We, we police it. We sort of say, no, you can't have one unless we say it. Yeah, yeah. But I've not been to any other doof in my life, so I don't yeah. know whether that happens Can't compare, else. yeah. Yeah, yeah then, I think some of the older ones did it. I'm not sure that they're like, I think it's pretty well controlled yeah. across the board now. I, then, I'm also not a doof. I'll put that out there. Yeah, but, yeah, um, A lot of my friends that I worked with 10, yeah. 12 years ago are now into it. Not yeah. as in party goers, but like yeah. working in some facility within it because obviously it, it was a progression at the time like <clears throat> when they got to that point it yep. kind of made sense and the music with the side trance and the techno and stuff and yep. sort of even the stuff that we worked with it kind of backs into it Yeah, so right. I think it made a lot of sense for a lot of people that we worked with in the early days to get into it mm-hmm. mm. so Ultra which is the, the yeah. humongous one so I'm guessing of... they're completely different they could have, they're almost worlds apart I assume well uh, we've changed the dates this year so Ultra is on the same weekend as, as Esoteric so oh yeah really that'll wow. be a massive challenge for me last year I went from um, what, uh, what's the, what was the thought process behind that uh, the issue was Sydney um, Sydney uh, yeah. was on a Sunday last year. So you are going to do Sydney this year? Yes, correct. Okay. So we're doing um, Sydney on the Saturday. Saturday the What's the setup for seven million dollars? Pardon? <laughs> <laughs> is it triple what Melbourne is? It's a lot of money, man. Yeah, it's for sure. a lot of money, and you know, you can buy a lot of houses with it. Yeah, <laughs> Let's put it that way, you know? <laughs> and it's a real daunting project, but we've got a lot of people involved, a lot of good people, a lot of smart people. So run me through this because we've had a conversation about this earlier, but I found it interesting. So I'm sort of sure. going to guide you into it and hopefully you understand where I'm yeah, going yeah. with it. Yeah. But the new legislations, what what do they look like compared to what they were beforehand? For in, in Sydney? Yeah. So they just, honestly, it means a lot more meetings. It means a lot more paperwork. Yeah. It means um, a lot more um, liability on us as the promoter. Yep. And it means a lot more money paid to the New South Wales government. As like a tariff or tax or one what they fee. want? One off fee. Well, why I, they want I think to it's about. I don't. I, I might, might speak out of touch here, but I think it's about, it equates to about four hundred thousand dollars per event, extra on top of what you would have been looking. Just at. as a tax. I, w- I'm not, I wouldn't say that tax is the right terminology, but it's it, it's a fee. I think there may be festivals for. And is there what's the what comes with that? Anything? Pardon? Is Nothing. Anything? You're, you're a high risk license. So what's that? What's that for? Is that a deterrent? Is it to deter people to do these things, or what? Uh, I think the I think the Liberal government have, have have basically tried to stop drug deaths in New South Wales, yeah. and yeah. this is one way of them doing it. Yeah. You know, there's arguments for. There's yeah, ar- well, arguments. We can go into that and talk about that for hours. There's ar- arguments against. You know, it's absolutely horrible what happened to these people. When we fortunately ran a, a super safe event, we had a very yeah. minimal drug. Um, rate uh, of, 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 of anything. So we we're super happy with it and we we're all wiping our brows afterwards. Yeah, for sure. And that was like, like just at the, that was at that the, was the beginning time. of that, of that real well, kind we of We had been, um, we had been, no, I shouldn't say movement, but you know I mean like when it all kind of started yeah, to collapse yeah. and, and it all came up into, I mean, when anything's on the front page of, of, of the paper in any state country, you know, you're going to get heat from it. So, yep. you know, I mean the way the New South Wales police had, had manned um, the front gate of, of our festival was nothing short of like, Military. There was. Wow. There was. Four I heard someone told me that you basically have to build an ER inside yeah, correct. the festival. Yeah, yeah. You have to. You have to uh, build um, like a like a like a camp hosp- hospital that's able to have surgery performed at any time. Open wow. heart surgery. Like I think is is the tagline. So they have two um, surgeons on hand just waiting there. Do just you have in to case. pay for the festival promoter takes. Correct. Yeah, you crazy. pay for all all um, um, New South Wales ambulance costs. So yep. look, I. Um, personally, I think that if that's what it takes to make sure people are safe yep. at, at our, our show, no problems. The police, that's another thing, you know. Do we have to have all these people here with f- assault rifles and drug yeah, dogs, yeah, yeah. you know? I don't know. Like that's it's some the, sort of... That's another riot. story. 
But look, I mean, if it deters people from taking the wrong um, sort of drug, yeah, but there's a lot of there's a lot of evidence that it's not that it actually causes. I'm not it. a scientist, and I'm also not. I don't want to get into yeah, this discussion either. because it's too I, long I, and too boring. My, yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but hopefully, everyone's all safe at all the festivals around the world all the time. Yeah, cool. <laughs> Good note. <laughs> um, so everybody, stay in school. Don't do drugs, <laughs> please, because us promoters will starve to death. Um, and our bar spends will be low. Yeah. <laughs> Keep them bar spends up because alcohol is legal yeah, and it's yummy. Um, so, yeah, I'll get, I'll, going back to the original question because we really diverted off that Sorry, one. Sorry, yeah, yeah. The difference between esoteric and ultra, like, yes. is there a massive difference? Because obviously the scale is what? Another 18, maybe 40,000 more people. Yeah. Probably more than that. I'm more assuming. than that, yeah. 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 Um, and they're two different ones, a one day event uh, with sort of massive EDM acts and whatever else it has, techno, blah, 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 blah. Look, one's more sort of like a niche community yeah. kind of festival. Yeah. What's the biggest difference between the two? I'll tell you what, I mean, we hired billboards for Punt Road for Ultra. Yeah. For Esoteric, we spent $3,000 on AO posters. Yeah, on crazy. Yeah. You know, so you're just trying to. But the foundations of it are fairly similar. I suppose, like. The structure and the way I run all the meetings and the way I run all the decision making is all exactly the same. Yeah. We have the top and then we filter down for everyone's got roles, social media, out, outdoor, digital, website, coordinators, all yep. that sort of stuff. It's all the same, but it's, we just target a different audience. Yeah, cool. That, that's all it is, you know. Um, working with the big American brands um, got its, its challenges at, at times because... Um, in typical American fashion, they're always right. They're yeah, absolutely yeah, yeah. always right. They invented the wheel and the car and everything else. Yeah, yeah. Which is tough, but... Um, <laughs> and the shotgun. Yeah. And the <laughs> assault rifle. <laughs> <laughs> but they get results, you know, so we have to respect yeah. that. Yeah, for sure. Um, all right, well, off the festival tip. I guess for myself, sometimes I look back on things that I've done and it's mm-hmm. hard to. I was even discussing with someone today. It's sometimes sometimes I only know that I've done something amazing when I tell someone the story. Yeah. So I'll, so I'll say to someone, oh, I did this. And they're like, what the fuck? <laughs> and I'm like, oh, I guess that is cool. So I guess <laughs> kind of reflecting on that in a five second version of like, what are some pinch, pinch yourself moments that you've had from being a 19 year old Kieran Dole to 30 year old Kieran Dole? I reckon I've got two. I reckon yep. I've got through now, just thinking about it now. Um, on stage at Sarah Sonic with Joel Fletcher in Melbourne. Yep. When Swing was like... The biggest dream around. Well, we, bas- we, we missed out on number one spot by fucking Pharrell Williams' <laughs> Happy. Mm. That's the best song of the decade. Yeah, for sure. How, yeah. That, how unfortunate is that? Like Joel's song was number two. Yeah, yeah. And it literally missed out on number one spot by fucking Pharrell Williams' Happy. Yeah, it's literally great, got great used on show. every... Yeah. <laughs> Honestly, it's the, the worst luck you could ever have. Yeah, it's yeah, horrible. Yeah. So standing on stage at Stereosonic Melbourne, we just phoned in from um, Adelaide on a fucking private jet. I remember that because you were late or something, Ballin. wasn't it? Yeah. Absolutely balling. Calvin Harris was on, was on the other jet. We're flying in from Adelaide. Standing side of stage, Joel played swing, Rock was on the mic and there's like probably, I don't know how many people, probably 25, 30,000 yep. people in front of us. All at this stage, not at the other stage, just going stupid for, for Joel. I remember standing there going, I'm the one who... Yeah, you know, help Joel and went get to here, and you know, because I was his paper. agent at that at, at the time, and Luke was his, was his manager. So it was it was that was a good. Um, so was it bigger than the loud stage? Yeah, <laughs> what, the loud bowl, or the, the loud bowl, the, the, mini, the mini, mini bowl, bowl, the mini bowl. The mini bowl for everyone listening was um, back in the day. My company, which still exists, sort of, but it's very much mm. a parent company to a lot of other events, called Loud Entertainment, which mm. was a real. St- a big company back then. It was probably yeah, one of yeah. the um, pioneers of yeah, yeah. lots of stuff. Yeah, we had a stage at uh, all the future festivals, mm-hmm. and the boys like Kieran and Heath and Stevie and whatnot. They played there. And some of the stages that had internationals would have like two, three thousand, and we'd have like six thousand. Mm-hmm. So it just sort of that was kind of the maybe one of the first times that what we were doing showed yeah. vo- volume yeah. because people was were cool. just like, "Fuck!" Like, I reckon there was points in the later years when Summer Days wasn't doing as well that our bowl was busier mm. than the main bowl. So, yeah. Um, it was yeah, cool. It was insane. It was just like a bunch of kids and it was the, it was, it was the days. Like, there's yeah, no doubt. Cool. Like, it was fun. We were just mucking around. I having think me fun. and Kyle were picking up cans from the rider and throwing them to our <laughs> mates in the crowd. Yeah, for sure. I remember I was emceeing and I almost got... <laughs> and what were yeah. you saying? <laughs> Can't say. I almost had to make everyone delete the videos. But the crowd liked it. But, um, yeah, it was just... It was generally... Like, I look back on them days and just think, fuck, yeah. that was fun. Like, yeah, that, that was cool. when we were super passionate. It wasn't... It was about... Just just a bunch of dudes having fun mm. and creating something new. But fun. Um, you said there's a second picture. Yeah, of um, probably when I was in sitting in the Universal Music offices in LA for the first time, I went to LA for work with me and Luke um, and just sitting there and seeing on the board, like, 
like a whiteboard in um, Neil Jacobs's office, just like um, like Bieber and Snake and yeah, crazy Ariana Grande and all these names. I'm like, holy fucking shit! I'm yeah, sitting wow. here in LA that our business is is paid for because yep. this is what we do, and we've come and speak into this guy about because Will at the time was co-managed by um, Interscope, which yep. is under um, Universal. Mm-hmm. So we're sitting there in, in, in Santa Monica in LA in this massive office and seeing these names on the whiteboard. I'm like, just I remember leaving with Luke and just going, what the fuck's going on? Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> so that was for me, I, I suppose, a couple of the sort of key moments. And I think probably like, you know, to be honest, like buying buying your, first, buying your house and like yeah. having like a nice car and stuff and being like, well, this is the fruits of... The labor. Yeah, of, of this world. I've managed to, to pave a career yeah. out of it. It's like a big one I love to talk about. So I was talking to Corey Top today. Corey Top is the guy who runs uh, Reminisce Events and that literally started as an Australia Day uh, party in his house. And last year they sold out, well not sold out, I think they did 8,000 people at the bowl. And it's like, it's bananas to think this dude just did it as a joke with his mates and then it turned into that. But um, I was talking to him about it after he finished and he was like, "Uh, yeah, it was cool, man. I was like, dude, like (laughs) think back. Like think back when you're at that party. Imagine if you could go back in time and just be like, bro, this concept is going to take you to the bowl. Like, and mm. he's just like, fuck yeah, true that. But it's like, um, I feel like I used to do a I lot more. I guess you're just reminiscing then. <clears throat> yeah, legitimately yeah. reminiscing. <laughs> um, I, yeah, true. I might call an event that and put it at the bowl. But um, he, yeah, I was like, sometimes you don't do it enough. And I feel like even myself, I try to. So some yeah. Of the, yeah, you've had experiences that are insane, like mm-hmm. talking even before I was saying stuff like watching Flume Flate plays first time in Melbourne or... or like you said, like being flown around the um the country or mm. even to different to different countries yep. on someone else's dollar because of something you do, or mm. and you just sort of sit there and it kind of becomes uh, as crazy as it sounds, it becomes normal. Mm. So you sort of start yeah. to not reflect on it. I know. And it's only when you You're talk right. to other people, then they're like, "What the fuck?" Like, yeah. And that's part of the reason, to be honest, that kind of motivated me to do this podcast because yeah. I always say, I always think to myself, not so much now as I said, like I'm sort of mm-hmm. uh, probably getting older and whatever, but maybe three, four years ago, I used to try to really regularly sit down and just go, mm. Danny man, like mm. think if you were 19, you're at some days watching these dudes. And now mm. not only have you booked some of these dudes, you've done shows with them, mm. like you're friends with them. It's mm. like you, you're you, like, yeah, it would have blew my fucking mind. Yeah. Mm. So it's unlike you to get sentimental as well. Yeah. He's very sentimental. Without a beer. <laughs> <laughs> well, we had a shot before. Yeah. <laughs> true. Maybe that's why. But yeah. So I just think that you got to like, it's otherwise no, you get to, get to a point where, you might as well work at Coles and pack shells because yeah, it gets like that. Yeah, but there's nothing wrong with that. Yeah, not there's at all, but I'm saying it, get, it gets like that though. So yeah. you sort of started... We're definitely one of the lucky ones. Yeah, and I there's so many times I go to an event and it's fucking pumping yeah. and it's just like, I'm just like, okay, cool, how many hours before I get to leave? Yeah, yeah like, know, And then know, know, you sort of, it's hard to go, like, imagine telling yourself, oh, you just did a 2,000 person show and you're now trying to get out of there as quick as yeah. possible. Sometimes so, I walk down into into Billboard on Thursday or Saturday and the place is Rams, one around the corner and it sounds unbelievable. Yeah. I stand there and go, it's cool. Yeah, this is fucking this sick. This is rocking. I feel like it's one of those things when you get there, you're always like, yeah, this yeah. Is yeah, but then when you're at home, you yeah. know. Uh, <laughs> this is draining it. About as much as this is going to suck. Um, yeah, cool. I guess, where, where do you reckon the next music style is sort of heading? Man, if... if we talk about this a lot, don't we? Yeah, you we know? do, yeah. I'm like with those HP boys, I suppose. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I, I, I don't know where it's going. I mean, we're sort of going a lot as as commercial as we can, I suppose, yeah. with our, our mainstream stuff. We're really trying to to, to, to follow that lead. Um, but then our our, our, our underground stuff, so that, that, that base house stuff is really cool. It's sort of happening. A lot of people are playing Crazy. it. It just it makes no sense that no one in Melbourne cares about it. No, so I know. Many genres. You, like you go to Brisbane, Adelaide, Sydney. Yeah, no, it's, it's insane. It's just mental. And that's um, one thing I think people don't realise. Like when they're kind of following even the Melbourne stuff and whatnot or following yeah. what DJs do, we're our own weird sort of hybrid community. Like yeah. What we're listening to is not what the world's no, listening to. No, no, you're right. Yeah. yeah. I think hip hop and, and whatever is only going to get bigger. Yeah, I the kind of agree. It, Obviously, in, we speak about this, but I feel like that Australian hip hop, new sort of uh, multicultural yep. stuff is yep. just on the cusp just, of absolutely just, blowing there's up. There's just so many people who are into it. There's yep. there's so many nationalities and, and, and so many it, groups and who are supporting it. And the stats are just it. retarded. Yeah. So I think that I think hip hop's going to get bigger and bigger, especially like the sort of Australian grown yep. stuff, which is Even great American. because, you know, I mean, Triple J is an amazing avenue for that stuff and they're constantly supporting it. So it's insane to see Triple J back some of the newer stuff, which yeah. is sort of a lot more violent, violent, a lot more grimy, a lot more yeah. street. 
Yeah. Whereas guys like Cursor, who tried for 10 years, they wouldn't yeah. give it into. Some of these guys are worse. Like some of the stuff they're saying or content is worse. Yeah. And Triple J's backing it. So, but yeah. they are. And it's the right time, right place, like we've spoken about before. Yeah. And I think it, for those guys, in my opinion, it is the right time, right place for them. I saw HP Boys got number two on the A1 Hip Hop. Um, yeah, yeah. Playlist today, which is it's the stu- it's insane. Like don't, these HP boys are a group in he- based from Hampton Park, which is legit ten minutes from where we're sitting. Yeah, yeah. Um, I've caught up with them a couple of times, and and they're super talented guys. And mm. and they, again, we're talking about that escalation of things. Mm. <clears throat> these guys, I think they released their first song three months ago. Yeah. And now they're talking tens of millions of plays across Spotify and um, YouTube, but quickly, very quickly. Yep. And it must be daunting for them to sort of the amount of people, including myself, sort mm. of calling them up and, and yeah. um, trying to trying to make something with them. Um, but I think from what I've spoken to, one of the guys called HP Finesse, who's sort of their manager, yeah. so they're sort of they're making some good decisions. They're sort of st- sitting down and <coughs> taking the um, taking it as it comes and mm. processing everything they're doing. And I think that he's he's done a really good job. So good hand, uh, sorry, shout out to HP Finesse. Yeah, they got a big future. They've got a big future and I think that it's going to continue and I, hopefully they become one of the pioneers of it. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah cool. Um, so, basically, other than that, I guess, any upcoming people that were sort of looking to get into this industry or um, young guys looking up to dudes that do what you've done and sort of where you've come from, what advice would you give them? And um, I It's a pretty think, generic question. This is probably the most generic uh, question I've asked, but yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I think you just need to talk to as many people as you can, whether you think they're um, in a position to give you advice or not. I think uh, that would be the, the best advice I would, I would be to give anyone because you're always going to learn from the ways that people do things. Make mistakes. I sometimes think that the guys you know? that work under me, I'm like, like oh, that, I let, they don't make the mistakes I made because I made them. And I'm like, fuck, I wish I had that when I was coming up. Correct, you know. Yeah. Uh, to, to, to learn the things that, that people have done wrong versus the things that people have done right because people aren't always going to disclose everything everything, yeah. everything to you know so my 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 first bit of advice would be to to go out to as many shows as many things yeah, as you sure. can and speak to as many people as you can because it's you know, unfortunately and enough as it is you know this in this music industry it's it meant to be about music industry but it, it's about how many people that you can connect and communicate yeah. with in order to get something out of something so and i feel like for myself even watching yourself like you when mm. you're coming up and obviously i was a bit older you could tell. So like someone who works in this industry, when you see someone who's genuine and like mm. generally loves it, mm. they yeah, don't come yeah, across can. annoying. So it's like, if you go out and you might be like, oh, these guys, I, mean, I don't want to annoy these guys. Don't get me wrong, you can annoy us. Like there's been times where I'm like, fuck off. Mm. But um, you get some dudes that come across and they'll talk and you know they're genuine and they want it. Yeah, and correct. we are looking for people like that all the time. So yeah. where it's not like you're kind of doing yourself a yep. disinterest if you don't do it. Yeah. Because there's so many times I meet a dude, I'm like, okay, I reckon I can turn him into something. Yeah, Because correct. of the way he stands or yeah, walks yeah, yeah, or yeah, whatever right. he yeah. is. Yeah. Um, and if you don't come up and say hello or don't do yeah. something that catches... Then you're going to miss an opportunity. You're going to miss that opportunity. Yeah. And it's like, you're always looking for agents. You're always looking for people correct. to work in your you're business. You're always looking for people. But you know, when they first start out, I'm sure if they're not passionate, you're not interested either. No, no. And it's definitely not hard to find any anyone who's who, I think, in this industry because... Yeah, well, you yeah. can literally see on, on Facebook or Instagram exactly where everyone's going to be. So yeah. it's a matter of, bit of doing a bit of research and, and, and going and, and chatting to people, you know. Yeah, not to answer my own question, but one of the things I always think about is like don't listen to your friends. Because when you're first starting out, I'm sure it would have been the same for you. Yeah. Everyone's I mean, they're like, just Man. the worst influence on you in all sorts of ways, you know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But it's like, I remember growing yeah. up, I'm like, what are you going to do when you grow up? Like, you're going to do this. You can't do this forever, bro. Like, yeah. Then, then 13 years later, I'm still doing it strongly. It's yeah. like, and thank fuck I didn't listen to my friends. Yeah, like, so one of the biggest things is everyone's going to criticize you when you try and do something different. Mm-hmm. Don't listen to it. Um, Just have a crack at Have it. a crack. And if, it, if you fall short on your feet, like, fuck, you get a factory job. They pay pretty good these days. Well, <laughs> that's like, it's going back to what I was saying before. If you have a, a, an income, a steady income that's yeah. not in this industry, you're able to treat this as a hobby and you're and that, able to treat it a little bit more differently. So you might take a little bit, more, a few more risks and stuff. That's, yeah, for sure. I think there's a misconception too. That a lot of guys look at, say, you doing lucky. Yeah. And they'll go, um, oh, cool, man. Like if I start an agency, I'm going to become a millionaire. And I think the reality of what they don't understand is everybody in that industry from higher, from like a lower level for myself mm. and guys like yourself and mm. the bigger guys running festivals and yep. whatnot, no one has their finger in one pie. No. Like our income comes from multiple places. Of and, I, and that's the only way that we can continue to do what we yeah, do and enjoy. Yeah, opportunities, yeah. And then multiple you get people like, oh, I'm going to work at this club and this is my focus. It's like, 
Well, I work at fucking five. I have five or six things on the go at yeah, any yeah, given time. Yeah, yeah like, yeah. and I have to because if one falls out, which happens regularly, because you're working in an industry mm. that is not stable in the slightest. We always say this. We always say Australia is not America, and in, in yeah. America, you need to be. Um, it's heavily regulated to be an agent. Yeah, you need to do a course. You need to be um, signed up to whatever body it is, and but they make heaps of fucking money off yeah, one, yeah. two, three, four artists, and they'll be agents for forty years of it. Talking life. three hundred million people, opposed to. Correct. Like, like I don't know. There's there'd be over twenty million people that live in LA. Yeah, I, yeah. I don't know if they're. I'm not really good at geography, but I'm sure there would be. But anyway, there's 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 that many people living in a, in a condensed spot, whereas we've got that in a whole entire country, yeah, which yeah. is the same size as and America. And our flights so, are so expensive. It, yeah. So essentially, everyone's so worried about what's happening in the states, and they're watching. Um, they're watching. You know. All, all these TV shows like like ballers and stuff or yeah, whatever yeah. Or about, about how these agents are doing so well and making so much money. It's different down here. Yeah, you can sure. do everything because if you don't do everything, then you lose. Yeah, hundred you know? percent. Yeah, Whereas, and there's t- and there's t- ups and downs. Like I'm sure you've been there where you're like we're starving and then you, then, then we're starving. having steak um, <laughs> steak with seafood on top of yeah. it. That's our little joke with myself for looking over. I won't go into it because <laughs> yeah. Um, cool. All right. Well, think, thanks for coming down, man. Like, no we really appreciate it. Um, I just want to say thanks very much for having me. I appreciate it. Being your guinea pig for the first yeah, time. Yeah, cool. I think we did a good job. And it's been cool hopefully to it's chat. interesting. Um, and one other thing I wanted to touch base on before you sure. leave is obviously there's been a misconception um, that you and I don't like each other. But as I said pre I really don't like you. lightly, <laughs> is that Kieran and I have been good friends since uh, at, we were teenagers. So um, I think it'll come as a surprise. And yeah. hopefully people are interested in what we, we've talked about and they can kind of see could that come to light how you can separate business to friendships so. mm. yeah i mean i've known you since i was what 16 17 I yeah think, yeah um I, a lot of people ask me hey, what is it with you and danny grant do you like each other or not yeah, I, go, yeah. I go man i speak to danny at least every week he's probably be my mentor uh, apart from luke you know yep. that's just that's just what it is we just don't carry on about it online because what are you always back i'm like we don't carry on online anymore we stopped because yeah, i deleted him <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> not <laughs> but, anymore um no, it's all good. I mean, it's been a long time, but I mean, this is what happens when, yeah, you can separate things and yep. yeah. Cool. All uh, right. Again, even though we said it before, thank you so much for coming down and um, I appreciate me. it. And hopefully you've enjoyed it as much as I have. Happy days. Cool, man. Thank you.